all political prisoners. Yeah. I, I have something written down too. <laughs> and it's not because I can't remember all I have to say, is that I have to remember to say all that needs to be said around Jericho 98 and Jericho itself. First of all, I'd like to say it's really, really great to see so many of you out tonight. And uh, because even though I've been here since Thursday and I've spoken a lot, a, a number of different places, that this is the biggest audience, I guess the, you could say the radio audience was the biggest audience. But so many of you came out when you could have been at the movies and you could have been dancing somewhere or home resting after a hard week of work or whatever and in the Chicago cold. And you could have said that this is not an important issue because it didn't affect you because the work you're doing is not work that's around political prisoners. But somehow or another, I hope that you will know and understand that if you're doing any kind of political work in the United States, any kind of revolutionary work or militant work or activist work or anything that is uh, not enforcing the status quo, then you're in danger of becoming a political prisoner. And if you don't know it, and if you don't know it, then maybe as early as tomorrow when you walk outside, you will know it. Or in the case of what's happening around the MLN and the National Committee here in Chicago with the COINTELPRO work that's going on, with people around you and the FBI knocking on people's doors, by the end of the summer, you may know it. And so, how, let's, I want to talk about Jericho in that context. Because Jericho didn't just fall out of the sky. It's not something that we made up yesterday. It's not something that we just started working on and, and 18 months ago in and of itself. Jericho is a combination of years and years and years of work around the issue of political freedom for our political prisoners and prisoners of war. And the Republic of New Africa, the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, has been doing Jericho marches for at least 10 years. But it's been done in a vacuum. Few people, only those people who actively recognize themselves as citizens of the provisional government and who attend Nation Day, wherever it's held, have been involved in Jericho marches. So Jalil Abdul Muntakin, a citizen of the Republic of New Africa, a political prisoner, prisoner of war, said to us about 18 months ago that we need to do a Jericho 98. He didn't say Jericho 98, he wanted to do a Jericho 96. But I said to him that we take time, we need to do time to make this thing as big as it can if we're going to do it right. So it became Jericho 98. He said we need to bring the issue of political prisoners out of the closet and put it on the front burner. And for those of us who have been doing political prisoner work, we knew how hard it is to get the support necessary to raise the issue of political prisoners to the height that it needs to be written, brought to. And those of us who were doing work around the case of Mamia Abu Jamal knew that it was possible for us to do this. Because we had done it with the case of Mamia Abu Jamal. We had made Mamia Abu Jamal almost a household word. And we had shown the power of the people in stopping the execution of Mamia Abu Jamal. But we also recognized those of us who knew about the instances of other political prisoners on death row. And in a lot of cases, Mamiya attests to it himself that the issue with Mamiya was that Mamiya was the only political prisoner on death row. But Mamiya denies the fact that he's the only political prisoner on death row. But we had to do something to raise the issue of that they are about to execute a political prisoner. And if they executed Mamiya Abu Jamal, then what did, would they do to us with all the support that he had? So we had to show that we had to draw a line of demarcation and tell the state that you can't cross this line when it was our political prisoners. But while we were doing that, Zion Israel was executed in Indiana. Zion Israel was not known, it was two weeks, a month before his execution, that the issue of Zion Israel became an issue that those of us in New York knew and understood about. And before that we could wage a campaign to stop his execution, he was executed. So we understood, we began to see clearly that we could not just raise the issue of one political prisoner, or 15 political prisoners, or three political prisoners in a vacuum, that we had to do something about people understanding that those political prisoners, had the government had to do hands off on our political prisoners. And so, we looked at how often political prisoners were coming home. We looked at the fact that the rule of Ben Wahad, after declaring his innocence for over 19 years, 
finally came home in 1990 after 19 years in prison and everyone knew and the state had the evidence that he wasn't guilty of what he was doing time for. We looked at seven years later in 1967, 1997, Geronimo G. came home after 27 years and the government again, government again knew that Geronimo G. Yaga was not guilty. But that innocent of guilt was not the issue. The fact that these people went to prison because of their activities on behalf of liberation struggles, independence movements, and activities to bring an end oppression of oppressed people in this country was the issue. And while we, they had laid their lap, put their lives out there on the line, and been victimized by this society, and was tried and convicted as criminals when the government could, knew that there was a political, these were political movements going on, and this was the issue that we had to look at. And we had a responsibility to deal with this issue. And as politi political people, we had dropped, we had dropped the baton. We had allowed this to continue over the years and have put forth no strategy or tactic designed to make sure that this did not continue. When this, the incarceration of our brothers and sisters was by design of the government, they had put a, together a strategy to make sure that our movements were destroyed and our finances were eroded and that our people were in prison and that the movements were in the streets were not there. That movement, that, that strategy that they put forth started in 1968. We had political prisons before 1968. But they put the, in writing in 1968 with their letterhead memorandum of 1968 that, and Jago Hoover orchestrated the fact that these movements had to be neutralized. And these leaders of these movements had to be neutralized. And these people had to be taken off the streets and in, by any means that they could deal with it doing that. Even if the evidence was not there to substantiate the charges that they were brought against these people. But they would, because they had the criminal justice system in their pocket, the courts in their pockets, the, 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 the police in their pockets, and all of them worked together in a concerted effort to do that, make sure that the government continue to exist as is, and all of these struggles were neutralized, they're able to do this. And the fear, tactics, and everything else at the hands of COINTELPRO were methods that he used to do this. And it worked, because our people went off to jail, organizations were destroyed, and the people languished in jails for years and years and years. And there were ebbs and flows in the support that was gotten for these political prisons and prisons of war. So, where did the term Jericho 98 come from? If any of you, some of you might have been to church at one time or another. <laughs> some of you might still go to church. I know Reverend, Reverend Yusaka back there from the, huh? Yashitaki. I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing your name, but I'll get it right one day. But you know, the heart is in the right place. I'm sure you understood in the biblical text of Jericho when Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and he marched around the walls of Jericho with the noise makers and everything else. And seven times he circumnavigated those walls of Jericho until the walls, and he laid siege to those walls until the walls came tumbling down. That's where Jericho comes from. And the walls we're talking about laying siege. And the walls we're talking about laying siege to is the walls that incarcerate our brothers and sisters inside the prisons and jails of America, of Babylon. And we intend to lay siege to it in such a way that the government of the United States will no longer be able to deny the existence of political prisons in this country. And when it rains, talks about amnesty. And when it talks about amnesty for political prisons in all the other countries around the world and human rights violations, that these countries, we're going to make it so that these countries will be able to say to them, what about these political prisons in your country? You can't talk to us about human rights violations because you have it having right in your country right there. And these are these people. They have faces, they have names, they have, and this is what you tried them for, and this is what they were involved in. So we intend to make this so prevalent, so well known, that the United States government will no longer be able to deny the existence of political prisons inside the boundaries of the United States. And so that's what Jericho is all about. The other thing, Jericho is also designed so that one part of that letterhead memorandum in 1968 was that they, as I said, they could take us out of the communities and organizing, away from our organizing efforts around all those other, other oppressive conditions that affect us and put us into the jails and the courts to organize, dealing with um, trials and everything else. And so we don't have the resources.
resources, people power to be the organizers and raising havoc with police brutality issues. We don't have the time to deal with the fact that the prisons are rising over and over again and all our people being thrown behind the bars in prisons. That they're used and where shadow slavery does not exist in the streets. That it exists behind the walls of these prisons. And they're used, being used as economic slave labor inside the walls. We don't have time for that because we're dealing with the issue of our brothers and sisters going back and forth to jails. And we're dealing with making sure that families are taken care of. And we're dealing with making sure that their treatment is being handled. But if we build a prison uh, uh, organization like Jericho to deal with the issues of making sure that the political prisons of these organizations are taken care of, then our other organizations, we can go back in the community and do our work of freeing our communities, freeing our people in an oppression and oppressive conditions that affect us as a people. But they did their job well. They did it so well that some of us are afraid to go back and organize anymore because we're wondering who's going to deal with us if we get cut and, and if we're picked up off the street as political prisoners. And if, we, if we're wondering that, then we're not out there doing what we should be doing. We're worried about the fact because our practice has shown we won't deal with the issue of freedom for our political prisoners. So we have to build Jericho design to take that responsibility off individual organizations and give it to one group of people under one umbrella to deal with the issue of amnesty and freedom for our political prisoners and deal with the issue of co uh, adequate medical care for our political prisoners and deal with the issue of making sure they get visits and commissary and adequate legal defenses and everything else. And we have to do that if we intend to be about, in, about the job of creating revolution in America. And we have to have strategies and tactics designed to make sure that this is viable. And we can't do that in a vacuum. We can, in the 30 years of being without, of a lull in our struggle, of block progression, progression in our struggle, show we're not capable of doing this. The 30 years where we have, where the government has been able to marshal its forces and plan for the next resurgence of revolutionary activities in this country, and the fact that we're not planning, we're not strategizing, we're not making it so that we can move our struggle from level level to another shows that we need to be about the business of building strategies and tactics. And Jericho 98 is part of that strategy. And it's across racial lines, it's a strong cross organizational lines, it's a cross movement lines to deal with it encompasses the, the Puerto Rican independence movement, it encompasses the American independence movement, American Indian movement, and the League of Insolvent, Indigenous Sovereign Nations, that Native American movement. It encompasses the, uh, the North American anti-imperialist uh, people forces. It encompasses the Japanese and the Asians and all of those struggles that are going on for national liberation inside this country. And all of us, cries as a cap, is something I never thought would happen. We're working together on a single issue, or building something to move us from one level to another. If we're able to raise the issue and deal with this Jericho project and raise the issue to the point where we get them to acknowledge the fact that political prisons exist, de facto, they're acknowledging the fact that we're involved in revolutionary struggles in this country. So understand very clearly, this is not an isolated incident. This is not something without a plan and a strategy and tactics. This is not something that we're going to we go and do or just a march around the White House. This is something designed to begin the real work after March 27th. March 27th and the, and the demonstration at the White House and the march in the field is designed to send a message to Washington that we're prepared to make those sacrifices necessary to build a movement in this country that moves step by step from one level to the next until we secure our freedom and our liberation. And Jericho 98 is a very good, big part of that because it's going to free us up to do the other work that we need to be about doing. And what is the strategy? The strategy beginning on, that began almost 18 months ago was to educate people about the existence of political prisons in this country, to put a face to these political prisons, and to, to bring it out in the open to those people who have never dealt with the fact that political prisons exist. Over the last 18 months, people have come on board in this struggle around the issue of political prisons that didn't even know political prisons exist, had never heard of it before. And in little towns all across America, they are putting together their forces to go to Washington on March 27th. They're bringing in, you got something that's going around the country right now called the Political Prisoner Rap Tour, you know, where these young white rappers 
and black rappers and, 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 and multicultural rap are going around on campuses helping to raise money for buses to go to Washington. You know? And as a... <laughs> that people thought would never happen. That the youth are rapping for political prisoners. You know? And you know, people thought that this whole rap thing was something we should not support. But they're supporting political prisoners, so I support them. You know? In Lily, Louisiana, a minister got up in his, in his pulpit on November 9th and preached a sermon called Jericho. And in his sermon, he talked about how Christians have failed their duties to deal with the locked, the, the conservated people, the prisons, people in prison. And that then he talked about what their responsibility as Christians was. And he talked about Dad Joshua and the battle and the circumnavigation of the walls of Jericho. And then he, at the end of his sermon, he talked about Mumia Abu Jamal. And he talked about Geronimo Giada. And he talked about all those political prisoners that we should have, the church, Christians should be about supporting. And it's about going to see about and doing their Christian duty of freeing the political prisoners and the incarcerated. If the ministers in a little town in Lily, Louisiana can talk about that, and they were not exposed to the issues and the struggles, then what about those of us who were exposed to it? We have not, have not we abdicated our responsibility to these political prisoners and to ourselves? One of the things that we're doing is we're pulling together people from all of those walks of life and a lot of issues, people that we've had contradictions with over the years, those contradictions fade in the comparison to the job that we have before us. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make people understand that we have an enemy out there that's much bigger than it, the fact that we have problems among ourselves. And that enemy is what has to unify us to do what we need to do to overcome them. And the strategy, again, is to build the strongest case for amnesty and freedom for our political prisoners Utilizing the first step that we're utilizing is those people who went to prison. So we go on that list that breaks those walls, that are denial down, is those people who, that we can show without a shadow of a doubt that their cases from the beginning to the end were came out of their struggles and their political struggles on the streets. Once we break down the walls, the next, our next phase will be for those people who became political behind the walls and their citizens have been lengthened and they've been under hum unhumane conditions behind the fact that inside prison they became political and they took up the struggle from inside the prison walls and we have a lot of them if the biggest i think the most well-known case that we knew was jo george jackson who gave his life to save the life of other political prisoners inside the walls and they shot him down behind the walls in the prisons and then you have the Rochelle McGee and the Hugo Pennells. And right here in, 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 in Illinois, you have Yat, Yat, uh, Ati Bashana and others like that. But we have to be strong enough. And then the third phase is we deal with those people who, because of the conditions in the street, the economic conditions and the racial conditions in the street, are victimized in, as oppressive press people who don't even know that they're part that the government is oppressing them. All they know is that they're knocking their heads against a strong wall. And we have the job, the responsibility, as those of us who are enlightened, who are educated, who are political, to go out and wage the struggle to end the oppression and end, and end the, the use of them as slave labor inside the prison camps. And to build companies like Lex, the Lexus, and build companies like Motorola and all those companies that are making millions off the backs of those people who are inside the walls of slave labor and who are going in for revolving door labor camps. So Jericho is a big endeavor, but we can do this because if we're already involved in organizing and politicizing in the streets, then we understand the significance of building a movement a building an uh, institution to deal with the issue of political prisons. So that while we're organizing, we don't have to worry about who's going to deal with us when we go behind the walls. And so I encourage you to get involved with Jericho. Get involved with the people who are working and understand that the political prisons inside the walls understand the importance of Jericho. And over and over again, I get letters from them saying, this is a fresh hope and real hope and real light that we've seen at the end of a tunnel for the struggle that we became involved in was renewed life and for us to go ahead and carry out what our job agenda was from the very beginning and that's to create the revolution in America. Thank you. On the
the home of Mia campaign from the very beginning, the International Food of Prisons Unite the Save of Mia Bujamal, that apparatus that was developed there with the whole food of prisons from around the world in support of the saving the life of Mamiya, that apparatus didn't just stop. It didn't go away. And then we transformed that into the whole issue of support for food of prisoners and international on the international level. And they and a lot of other different countries, they're going to be having solidarity um, acts on the same day in the various countries at the U.S. embassies. And um, matter of fact, the first week of March, I'm going to Toronto and I'm speaking there uh, during that week around Jericho here. Um, we have had people, Kazi Torre, a former political prisoner, went to South Africa and, and talked to members of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission down there, and they're raising the issue of freedom for political prisoners here in this country. And one of the things they're talking about doing is sending a representation, representative from the Truth and, Re uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission from South Africa here to Washington to participate in Jericho. So we're, and the other thing, are countries who have actually stood up for it, and the first and foremost country that has been in support of our political prisons has been Cuba. Cuba has been under sanction for a number of years, but they have also been in support. They have 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 been in about the political prisons here. And they have actually been active and, and by the support of Elena Morales and Asano Shakur and other political prisoners who have exiled in Cuba, they've not just talked about political prisoners in this country, they have evidence that to their support of the political prisoners. And, and you, you all know the Pope and even the, when the uh, New Jersey State um, Police Officer, the Colonel Order Police, asked the Pope to intercede with Castro to return Asano Shakur back to this country, the Pope went to Havana and came back and Assad is still free in Cuba. And, uh, and, then, and so that kind of situation supported it. Support, and what we have to do is do our job here. And it's very clear is that those countries cannot stand up and support our political prisons if we don't build a movement in this country in support of our own political prisons. And so we have to do the job of making it to their benefit to stand up for us by us standing up for ourselves. Safia Bukhari Austin was a political prisoner for almost nine years as a result of her involvement in the Black Liberation Army, a revolutionary group that evolved out of the Black Panther Party of the 1960s. Safia now spends most of her time working with black youth in the community, specifically addressing the issues of black imprisonment. She focuses both on the situation of political prisoners and the conditions of confinement, especially within the New York State control units. We were fortunate to have Safia as a panelist in our afternoon workshop, and we are thrilled to have the opportunity to hear from her once again this evening. Please give Safia a big hand. was geared around 
trend you ain't knew. In New York, it was around trend of down to 21, but it was still around building an organization that could free you and Newton and using the, is the issues that affect the black community as a basis for organizing. Uh, using the, the 10 point programming platform, which was the basic needs of the peop of people to educate them that the reason why Huey and the 21 and all of them were in prison was the fact that they were about self determination for black people. They were about full employment for black people. They were about decent housing fit for the self of human beings. They were about decent education that teaches us our true history. Uh, stopping police brutality. Uh, stopping uh, black men being going off to fight in foreign wars and coming back to be uh, becoming third class citizens. People say second class, but before you get to be second class, you got we got the bottom, so you're not even second class yet. So um, the Freeing people, black men, women, and children from prisons because they hadn't received fair trials, and on and on and on, not being allowed to fight in military services. And this is the reason why the Black Lives Matter became national, a national organization because it dealt with the issues that affect the masses of black and oppressed people. One of the reasons why the Black Lives Matter was destroyed was because of the fact that it was all around, around concrete issues. And it was not afraid to say that um, in order to get them off our back, get them off our necks, that we had to go out and take them off. They not can't act them. We had to take them off our necks. <laughs> now, I came into the back of the party understanding with, with, with a misdirect, uh, mis indirect. Analysis, think that the Black Panther Party was all about talking about what was happening out there. In 1971, I ran into the Republic of Africa, which was talking about, was founded in 1968, and they were talking about a provisional government and declaring the independence of the United States and declaring their, their right citizens of the Republic of Africa. The whole land question. Because independence is based on land. And if you don't have any land, you can't have independence. The provisional government was talking about, of course, a lot of strategies and an agreement, but at the concept of a provisional government, I agree with that if you're not going to be free by um, going along with the status quo, you have to separate yourself from that enemy and tell him he doesn't have the authority to do anything to make you follow his law, because his laws were for made for you in the first place. So, naturally, it made sense to me. So I ran right down to the RNA and became a citizen. So now I'm a member of the Black Panther Party, which was a paramilitary black organization whose primary objective was to establish revolutionary political power for black people, who believed that political power rolled out of the barrel of a gun because the vote just didn't count for black people. And then I went one step further and decided that they were not going to tell me I was a citizen and then treat me like I was a dirt under their feet. I was going to make a determination of whether I was going to be a citizen or not. I decided I didn't want to be one. <laughs> Quite naturally, they didn't take this lightly. <laughs> it's understood. Because, um, but then I took a lesson from the history books. And their declaration of independence says whenever a government does, um, abuses and the uh, rights of the people is the right of that people to throw out that government and institute a new government that works by the people of the people and by the people. <laughs> what are we talking here? We're talking about revolution. We're talking about sedition. We're talking about treason according to their law. They don't want you that. So what did they decide? They, they used co and tell pro to counterintelligence for you and those of you. And that's understandable because nobody wants to, the kind of why anybody allow anybody to destroy their thing. So it was like me sitting in somebody's house up my arm and kick them out of their own house and take their house from them. If they knew anything about it right next to it, they're going to be trying to make sure I didn't do it. So I don't fault them for going to the because I've been trying to stop them too. <laughs> what I fault them
him for, and I fought us for it, but I don't let me get away with it. Now, the very first time I got arrested, since now I already set the stage, the law will be defending me because they won't rent me from me. So when they arrested members of the black guy's body, um, one of my first things was to try to get them out of there. Why the lawyers were dealing with the courts, and they were doing anything, but that's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to go to trial, and I'm the legal end. Those of us who were about revolution, who did recognize their right to have them in the first place, both about getting going and ain't getting them. <laughs> so the very first arrest I took was for trying to break out six BLM members out of the New York tomb, at the tomb in New York. They called it a great tomb escape. Or a tomb. When they caught me, they put a ten thousand dollar contract on us because they couldn't get us tied in New York on that. So they put a $10,000 contract out that I wasn't supposed to be arrested. I was supposed to be gotten in a position to have to be killed on sight. Uh, and who told us? Why are we organizing? Let's get step back. Why are we organizing? We cannot allow ourselves to just organize those people who are about the same things we're about. We have to organize the fifth column from within. The same way they're going to infiltrate us, we have to infiltrate them. The organization has to have all guys have to have them on all levels. From the churches, from the schools, from the police departments. Because they have black and border and get on the sea of people that are inside those institutions also. They don't like what's happening there. The correction officers. They in our communities. We have to organize them too. So they're somebody's brothers and sisters. And they're somebody's mother mothers too. And fathers. So our organizers, we have to get sophisticated enough to organize on all those levels. Because they're the ones who can give us the information that we need in order to get things done. We cannot. We have to learn from revolutions from all around the world. We didn't just organize those people in the little, the little clips, in little groups. And because I don't write that, what they're about, I'm not going to talk to them and organize them. The masses of the people mean the masses of the people. It does not mean just those people we like. So... Who told me about the $10,000 contract? Members of the New York Guardian Society, the black police in New York, who did not go along with that. I'll never check out who they were, but they did, they were the ones who told me. So we got up and left, and so the other folks tried to be getting into the tombs, because it's every, then I heard they had a black liberation army lady. While I was going to run underground, they, they were, Oh, we have to use all our skills. We have to use those technical skills of this protective society. <laughs> anyway, so we ended up in Virginia, in a shootout, ended up captured, and we watched trials and trials and trials where people were saying we didn't do it, we didn't think about doing it, and they were went to a lot of people that actually go to trial because they were teaching, using trials as clinical readers to teach about what the court system was like. We already figured, my side, my co-defendants and I, in our unit, which is called, I'm a side collective of the Black Liberation Army, we had decided that we were not, we were going to take a prisoner of war position. That the courts of the United States did not have the jurisdiction to try us, and we were not going to allow, sit back and allow them to make us subject to them because we weren't. So they tried us, and one day, they had a, they picked the jury, tried us, convicted us, and took us all to jail in one day. Took us and took us off to jail on one day. They were out to make a statement that we were, they were to make an example out of us. In our, throughout our incarceration, we were, we decided we were going to make a statement and make an example for the community of what being a principal was all about. The very first, even before we got elected, we had decided that. The first thing we were going to do is try to get out of here. That was what we were supposed to be about. As prisoners of war, under UN Geneva Convention, the responsibility of the people coming is to escape. That's what they teach you in the U.S. Army. If you can't, you try to escape.
took it out the personal. <laughs> she took it very personal. Because she said I was a model prisoner. Why was I a model prisoner? Because I, I went into prison with an objective to escape. So I didn't have time to get into the pity of anything in prison. <laughs> you know? Because I had one objection. I object to escape. And I told them, when they came, they brought me into prison at night, put me in that security, told me they won't go empty cell line population. So, for 21 days, I stayed in that security while they tried to find me a cell. Then they told me I couldn't go into population because I was, um, I was able to stand on the organized population. Then they told me that they didn't have enough security for me, so they signed a guard when they finally let me out to walk around the prison with me all the time. And, uh, and, you know, and inside the purpose of the institution, this man carried a gun. And it was just me. The only one who was in prison in Virginia was F. Custody, Rose Custody. And so they couldn't find nothing for me to do. They took, I, couldn't, I couldn't work in, in the li uh, laundry because there were too many doors. I couldn't work in the kitchen because there were too many knives. And therefore I had to work on the chair so I could get sweet. And they didn't really want me to do that because I was by myself. <laughs> But well, anyway, the old, they said so before they let me out, they sent the correctional officer down to find out. What, so she could talk to me to find out what she wanted me on her chair. And she asked me what was my intentions, and I told her I was going to be here two years and I was gone. <laughs> One of the things that was clear to me from the very beginning is they do not believe. When you tell the truth, they don't believe you. Here. We go back to our communities with a new 
new commitment to move this brother forward. We go back to our communities with a new dedication to build a movement grounded in concrete work designed to throw off the shackles of oppression. We go back to our communities with a new reaffirmation of our determination to tear down the walls of America's prisons with the knowledge that when the prison doors are open, the real dragons will fly out. Join us in that. 